Welcome into season two, baby, of Scurry in the Scrub. It is your boy Jordan Scurry back here with my man Matt D. Marinas. We are Scurry in the Scrub back at it season two. I'm excited. Matt, how you feeling, man? Good to I'm be back. Good. I'm feeling good. I'm not I'm not vibing with the seasons thing because I I'm a I'm a there is no off season type of guy. Okay, I I respect that. Only re- okay, only you reason I said season two though yeah. is just because it's like our second. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have my Blue Jay seasons anymore, like college ball season. <laughs> That's right. So I guess the beginning of the season is just where where why I'm saying season two. It's been a minute since we talked to the people too, so it's like there is a little bit of a there has. I been know the people missed us. We had to give them all yeah. all three people probably had to give them what they want. So just read we back, baby. Yeah. <laughs> It's like allow me to reintroduce myself. Our name is exactly. Yeah, no, I'm we back. You. We better. We haven't recorded since it hasn't been since Ben's did, episode, right? When did we last record? Um, I think it was Ben. Yeah, Ben might be the last one we did together. That's a good call. Yeah, yeah. So it's good to be back. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad to have Blue Blue Jay basketball to talk about again. Get back on that. It's been a while. Haven't really talked about it in a while, all in depth like this. Well, it's, yeah, it's hard because you know it is there is a literal off season, even though we don't rest, you know. Uh, yeah. So it's like, yeah, you just you just wait for things to spot. We always said when we went into this that we wanted to not force ourselves to talk to each other, like mm. you know. I think I, so. We're like, yeah. we we want there to be like something to talk about when we record that was our Absolutely. like that was our oh that was always goal. the goal the start was to not force like you know a bevy of takes onto people so now with like preseason polls out and the schedule release and the rosters and like we have like some concrete things we can we can actually find on into, right? so yeah it's not yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's time it's time for us to come back basically i think i just miss it what it is is i think i'm still just not used to not like seeing you in the off season yeah. where we were still rattling off like two, three hour conversations that easily could have just been a podcast. Like yeah. I'm not used to not having those <laughs> the off season. So it takes an adjustment period, but it's good. We save up more topics to hit on here. Yeah, for sure. Well, we've had some life adjustments too. Like you're, you're uh, you got nice new digs. Oh yeah. We had to get it. That's what I'm saying. Back and we better. I had to get a new, new spot to record from. Right. I had to get the equipment right, a new little camera, everything. You know, we're all about the level up here at Scary in the Scrub. Yeah, so I, I, maybe I will vibe with you on the season two thing then, because there is like, you did level up in terms of every. It, nothing's the same as it was when we left it. So yeah, there were some pretty concrete things that I had lined up, I guess, in the past few months. So yeah, no, I definitely feel like I took a step up, so to speak. Yeah, for sure. So we obviously we want to dive into like our opinions of what everyone thinks, you know, the men's and women's basketball team for Creighton are going to be like this year. But my first thing is they, the men's team just did their closed scrimmage with Missouri. And I mean, you know, from the last time you guys played Missouri your senior year, that there wasn't a whole lot that came out of that in terms of uh, hard, I don't know, just information, right. Whether it was like, a score, statistics, something to chew on a little bit. So the question I thought I could ask you that might be able to provide some kind of a window into what went down on Saturday at the CHI, um, even though neither of us were there, is what what are closed scrimmages like structurally? What do you – like, are they mini games? Are they just like games? Or, you know, is it like 10 minutes we're going to focus on zone defense, zone offense? Is it like 10 minutes we're going to do press break stuff? Is it like, is it structured a lot like you guys would do in live five on five practice? Or is it more like an exhibition game that no one gets to watch? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked that because it's different every year. It was different every year, I think, for me. Uh, It it was. I want to go back to just the Missouri one. I think that one was we structured it in like, because usually it's just like two big halves you play. Like you play like a first half and it's like more competitive. And then sometimes in the second half, like I know when we went to Minnesota too, we did like a second half where like 
coach started throwing out different lineups. You did some zone stuff. So it wasn't, uh, the score wasn't kept as heavily like in the second half, like coaches were just like, we're trying out different things, Mm -hmm. um, trying to do some zone stuff, want to do some press things like for eight minutes or whatever of that half, uh, more clunky. Like, would you stop and start more? And like, yeah, uh, there would be, there was more of a hard stop, like at halftime. And then like you or halftime, it was like after that first 20 minutes, there would be like a hard stop and you would get the vibe that like, Oh, sometimes we would even go through like situational stuff. Right. Like, so we would have like do sideline out of bounds things underneath, even against them. There was more of definitely hard stops to change up like what exactly we were doing. Generally though, that first 20 minutes is like getting up and down, trying to get after running your set plays, like running the early sets, the quick hitters, um, the, the staple plays that you usually go through in games, the game, the plays that Mac likes to open up games with those type of things. Mm -hmm. Those will get out in the first like 20 minutes and then trying to get up and down and transition that first 20 minutes is definitely for that. But yeah, no, it's always, it, it has been different. I think some one year, uh, at Minnesota too, I think we might've played three different like periods. It might've been like a, a mm-hmm. 20, 10 and 10. Um, cause I remember I played in one of those and I got in like in the last 10 minutes, got to get up and down a little bit. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Cause I, I know from talking to Flan's really open about what they do structurally. So like it's, if they play Iowa every year and they're close scrimmage there. So there theirs will be this upcoming Saturday and the way they do it is like, it's two halves. And then there's like a 10 minute period where everyone who didn't kind of get a lot of run and a lot of reps, they'll play like a 10 minute period where all those players are just getting their repetitions in and everything, but they add it to everything they've done. So when you look at it, it's like kind of one big picture, but it doesn't tell like the story of how that went about. So I, I, I'm, yeah, I was curious to pick your brain a little bit about structurally what goes down in those close scrimmages. Cause I can't imagine it's just like, it's like, it's like two twenties and then you're, it's like a regular game where no one gets to see it. It's, it's a little bit different, right? Yeah, no, it's, it, it's, it is different. It's used a lot. I think the way Max very strategic, you know, so I think the way he's, he's using it for that film and especially of situational things, he wants to be able to break that down uh, further and kind of get at like, where you're supposed to be situationally, where um, you need to be for certain plays, that kind of thing. Um, but like, that's what I mean. It's different every year because they kind of just want to let guys play yeah. too. You know, at this but point in, in the preseason, it's like let guys get up and down, give them a new look instead of playing against each other all the time. That's what I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because that was my question. You guys obviously watch film or when you played, you guys obviously watch film of your practices, right? So you would mm-hmm. see the same kind of like mistakes, good and bad, like against each other um on a daily basis before each practice to kind of improve as you go along what's is it different when you see it against someone else when you see the simulation oh Oh, really yeah no it's it's great too uh it's funny there's like i remember the one time at missouri was cb actually who it was his first time like really getting up and down at the beginning of that year like running at the five Mm -hmm. and it, it's funny because you start to learn the plays that because when you're playing against each other and running through these plays all the time, like everyone knows the plays, like, you know, to go under a certain screen so you don't give up like a layup and all that for certain plays. But then you go play another team who doesn't know the little ins and outs of the play and like that you're supposed to go under and then catch them going over and get a layup. So it's nice because then from playing the in the close scrimmage, you just get a gauge of like, oh, if I really run down the floor on this play, I'm going to be wide open because mm. that like something's happening like that they're not going to be able to read in the like because that's what's so great about the offense it's so fast it's like oh you learn if i just do this make me that much more open or this will set up a teammate to be open so yeah no the close scrimmage is definitely help with that that's true so, the, so there I'm is glad you brought that up so there is some nuance and it does enhance like it just it reaffirms what the coaches are telling you and you see it from a different perspective when you do get to finally face someone who isn't your scout team and doesn't know what you're doing oh yeah do it Cause it's like, I feel like, I think, you know, the play, the Dakota. Yeah. Right. That's the one that it's like, you didn't re- you don't realize until you go play somebody else. Who's also not like running back the way that we run back at Creighton and things like that. Don't, don't have the safeties. You realize you're like, Oh, this play is, that's why it's so open. It's cause it's like, Oh, when people don't know that that's what's going on on the weak side, yeah, <laughs> that's when it's, 
That's a how quick hitter, you know? It's so, yeah. It's a banger. It's little plays like that that you learn where to screen exactly and, like, where exa- – like, you when you need to be in the corner for – like, why being in the corner for this play is, like, so crucial for it. Mm-hmm. You learn those things kind of when you get to play against somebody fresh and new and doesn't know how to be in the gap to prevent certain things for a play and whatnot. Yeah. No, I'm glad you were able to provide some insight on that because that's really – without – you know, so I, I don't think it's I don't think we're going to get any information from that because I think, you know, Quanzo Martin uh, and Matt kind of have an agreement that there's not going to be a whole lot from it. And I'm just going back referencing the way it was your senior year. There wasn't a lot from that either, other than the film you guys were able to learn from um, yeah. from the outsider's perspective. There wasn't a lot we took away from that. So I don't imagine that's going to be any different this time around. Uh, but your insight into what that's like is is interesting because it, it does feel like if people were to see stats or something, um, we obviously would react to it a certain way yeah. from the outside looking in stats would but, not do the close scrimmage justice. Yeah. That's what I'm kind of getting at. Right. Like there, it's just a different, it's a different structure, a different perspective. Like what you're getting out of that is more about the value in the, in the repetition and the nuance that you talked about. Now it's not necessarily the result of what happens. Right. It's, it's really just to get on the same page. Like it's, it's what I was just talking about and being able to get on the same page about like little plays here and there. Like that's the value in the close scrimmage to me, at least mm-hmm. like just being able to have your teammates and be like, Oh, you, you see how the defenders actually react when we run that. Mm-hmm. Let's remember that going forward now, mm-hmm. you know, like it's, it's more of that than who scored points or so-and-so had rebounds. I mean, Obviously, you want to get a cool, you want to get the dunks in there and yeah, all well, that. But it's nice to, it's nice it's to play. Not, nights, it's right? not, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's but. not about like, yo, I'm about to go get 30 in this. It's like, no, let me mm-hmm. find what my lane is right now for this season and how yeah. I can kind of take that and run with it. And from a rotational standpoint, is there, is, do things get ironed out better in that or does that still take some more time with the exhibitions in the early season non conference? I think it takes time too. And I, and I know Mac. Mac likes to try different things out. So, like, I even remember when our scrimmages, it was a lot of uh, playing, like, even years back, like, Mark Marcus Foster was, like, playing at the one in some of them and just mm-hmm. off ball, like, just trying different things out, you know, mm-hmm. like, different things with the lineups depending on who's playing point guard and all that. So, yeah, I'd yeah. say it's more – it's it's not – not for – I don't know. No, there's no nothing really solid to any of the rotation. Yeah, that makes sense. Because you do see it get ironed out as the season goes along still. So it's not mm-hmm. it's not something where you're like – where you go into that close scrimmage with a preconceived notion and you're just trying to confirm certain things. Like that close scrimmage really is uh, something that sets a baseline for you because it's the first time you get to see a, an opponent who doesn't know all the intricacies of what you're doing from a, in, from a set standpoint. Um, because, I, I, you know, that's the part of the thing where you guys got to get tired of playing yourselves in practice because you just there's not a whole lot to catch you off guard with right you kind of just are go- at, at some point you find yourself going through the motions because you've done this every single day for three four weeks now so a lot of yeah, it no it's kind of it's it's nice to get out and like play against someone else for sure because that played against what it's just knowing when your teammates know the plays like scout team too like especially for we were supposed to run the play to miss like to be stopped like it it was you know and you're getting to a point when you're going through that that you're like man i just want to go get buckets on someone else can we just (laughs) can we speed this up and you're just itching because the season's right here you're like all right how many more dress rehearsals like let's get to it (laughs) yeah so So, uh big east media day in new york was what's today was that last week that was last week it was last week huh yeah so I don't know why I can't find where the Jays are now. Man, speaking of Jays, shout out my man AOC and the Fresh Fours. He rocked out Ooh, for, right? for for yeah. for media day, and we had the light blue. He had the light blue polo. Shout out to the Creighton, I guess whoever is in charge of ordering those polos because we came a long way from just the royal blue or the white <laughs> to these nice light blue. Yeah, how do we? You know, I like the light blue. You know, what's our what's our official like? Oh, for sure, the baby blues are my like. If they wore those every day, I'd be like, I'd be set. So, what's the official like? Scurry in the scrub take on 
uh, Jay's going like casual Friday at me. It was so I, I I dug it, but like it was so cool watching like or when I saw the picture of all the coaches like suited and booted, and then Max kind of like he stuck to his guns when he said last year he's not wearing a suit again unless he's like forced to do it. So if he's given, no, I choice, like it. I I'm like with, I like that. the casual look. I think more need to keep going to it. Same. I think in Mac, I don't know where he got it from, so I'm, I'm not speaking on his behalf or anything. But I like that. That's like a thing in the NBA with coaches now yes. too. They're very, they're really trying to be more lax with like what the coaches right. are wearing the games and all that. And I'm I'm here for that. Like Doc Rivers pulling up, like he's wearing like the just the quarter zips to games and yep. stuff. I'm like, mm-hmm. I like that. Like. That's a good, it's a good look. I think the quarter zip and like the khakis, like go off color. You know, you can go beige, gray, black, whatever, like whatever suits you. Like, but I like the quarter zip and khakis with like, you know, it just feels some, more like a sporting event. Yeah. yeah, just or like go some low cut Jordans, go some low cut Jays, or you know, rock the Jordan ones with the with the different colorways and stuff. Like, I think some more flair on the sidelines is like the way to go, as opposed to just suited and booted and. Or the but I don't even think piece, that's like, flair. Like I think that's it's being calmer about it. It's just making it more of a, yeah. I guess, athletic event. It feels. I will say too, from a player's perspective, I think when you're when coaches are in like polos and like more athletic, it makes them feel more of a part of the team than when they're in a suit and all that. And I think so. Like at halftime, I don't know. I we'll have so. to we'll have to ask Mac when we do the roster preview of the pot, roster preview podcast. Like what if it if it if he feels different in in casual versus like the you know the all yeah. black tux and reverse yeah we'll have to get on that with him i, I want to know where it came from too yeah for sure i think he's just like uh, the more he watches doug and the more he sees like doug's coaches like just you know all in casual dress like it's like that's where i think it came he's a little too. jealous he's like man i want to wear that so we'll see that's what his answer is. is um yeah I, uh, the fans weren't weren't loving it though they like the the feedback was like why aren't the jays suited up i'm like Dude, this is the way to go. Oh, yeah. You know, all I know is there were three, there were three coaches wearing polos at Big East Media Day. It was Jim Flannery, the women's coach for Creighton, Mac, the men's coach for Creighton, and then Gina Oriema, who's won like 10 natties. And like all I'm saying is they were in good company. So connection. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Flam was like related, Flam, related. Flam said, I don't Flam know. Gino wanted like him next to him in the picture because they were both in casual. So like. I'm just saying the trend is like it, you got good company so right. far in the trend. Do what the cool kids are doing, right? Yeah. Like, isn't that <laughs> yeah, I know that's right. I mean, you can look good in a suit. That's not that like let's not say you can't, but yeah, it's but I think they wear suits enough too, and there's so many like coaches events and everything all mm-hmm. year long that I'm like, hey, if they want to just wear the quarter zip or a polo to this one, yeah. I'm not gonna sit here and complain about it. And the fact that they went baby blue with it too is like you just won me a over. Baby blue. More. That's what I'm saying. Like they looked good. They're so so clean. They had to feel good. They weren't uncomfortable all day in a suit and like in bad shoes and stuff, like uncomfortable shoes. So they were in. They were rocking comfortable kicks and they were wearing baby blue. It's like how could you not feel good about walking around that day? I think they were. And that's actually now. Vibe. And that's like, and from your perspective, even don't you think as someone who asks you ask Mac all questions after the game and everything. Yeah. Don't you think they're going to be more apt to like be in a more conversational mood if they're comfortable and not in a suit? For sure. You know? That's, you know, like, it's like the, yeah, it's the whole Oregon thing. Like that started like 20 years ago. Look good, feel good, play good. Like it's, it's just all a thing. Like you got, yeah, oh yeah, they're all connected. I'm down for it. Like if we'd ever see another coach in a suit again, I'm like, I'm, I'm I wouldn't be upset. Yeah. I'm good with no. that. So, uh, Standings wise, though, the Jays were picked eighth. I don't. Um, so let's just run down the preseason uh, coaches poll in the Big East real quick. Villanova, no shocker, number one, uh, 10 first place votes. They can't vote for themselves. So that was that's a unanimous number one right there for Villanova. Um, UConn at two. They got the other first place vote. So Jay Wright gave the hat tip to UConn. Xavier's three, uh, St. John's is four. Um, Seton Hall's five, Butler is six, and then there's a little bit of a gap. This is where the gap starts. So Providence is seven. They're 15 points back of six. The Jays are eight. They're eight points back of seven. Marquette's nine, 11 points back of Creighton. Um, Then Georgetown's one point back of them in 10th. And then DePaul, (laughs) poor DePaul, got all 10 last place votes. So 
They're starting in the cellar with the new coaching staff and everything. Unit. So we got a unanimous number one and a unanimous number eleven in Villanova and DePaul. And what's the your, rest is all. Yeah. <laughs> what's your feel? What's your feel? What's your gut? Like your first initial like reaction to what 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 stands out to you either something that you agree with or disagree with right away when you the know. thing that stood out to me the most i think was yukon i i didn't really know too much about who they got in this off season and everything until i had looked into just like all the hype i guess around this team i'm interested to see if they're going to be as physically like dominating and imposing as mm-hmm. everyone's making them out to be and just and from what i've read and everything about what they have going on now that was the one to me. And then I think the rest of it is all from after UConn, I guess, the rest till the end. I'm like, that's to me. I'm like, this is a toss up. It depends. Yeah. what I don't know what those teams identities will be similar to how I don't know what Creighton's identity is really going to. I mean, I know what it wants to be, but I don't know if it'll be. I don't know how long it's going to take them to become that. So, yeah, we'll see. Those teams, I think, are all going through a process in some way, shape or form in trying to figure out how they're going to play this year. And so, yeah, I don't know. What stood out to you? I, I'm, I'm with you. I did not – I didn't – I was surprised that UConn was as highly thought of as they were. Like, only because I'm not – I'm not doubting that they're going to be physically imposing. That's mm. the part I think is going to be kind of like a non-negotiable with them. Like, I figure – it, almost like Creighton. I think Creighton is going to get up and down, try to play with pace, um, try to spread the floor, um, and try to get high quality of shots and as many as possible. Um, I think UConn's going to be really physical. I think Villanova is going to be really smart. Like those are the things I just assume are going to be non negotiable with those programs. The thing with UConn is um, they really struggled last year without James Booknight, who obviously was a top 10. Uh, where, where did Charlotte take him? Eleven or ten? Where was mm-hmm. it? Either way, lottery pick, right? So he's off to the NBA. He's their best player, and they weren't they 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 really 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 struggled to score when he was hurt last year. So how do they how do they solve that? I don't think they didn't at least they they didn't solve that in the offseason with an obvious answer to me. To I think that's what stood out to, to me. Put right. them to elevate them to. A comfortable number two behind Villanova. That's why I'm like, why? What? What? It's. It's. I, I think agree. it's just UConn love. I really do. I. I think, it's I think that's a thing. That's because I think you and I are both thinking back to the last we saw of UConn, and now everything being said, and it doesn't really add up. Yeah. You know, like you're taking like for that away. So, okay, you'll still be really physical. You'll still play great defense, but can you score enough to challenge Nova at the top of the league? That's a. You can't, you cannot win this league unless you score. Like, talk about the defense and the toughness and the Big East, blah, blah, blah. The best teams in this league every single year, the ones that are at the top of the standings when everything shakes out after the 18 to 20 games are done, are the best offenses in the league. Guys who got bucket games. Buckets. You've got to score. <laughs> you right? got to get, you have to have. Yeah. And that's why I think I, I'm in. I'm intrigued by UConn because I'm like, who is going to be their bucket getter? Yeah, I do not sure. know. So there's opportunity there. Mm-hmm. There's, we'll see if they can consistently do it though. Cause again, we've only seen them in the big East for now season, like yeah. it, to sustain getting buckets, like James book like he's obviously an NBA talent, but injuries and everything. It's hard to sustain that yes. for a big East season. It's hard to be able to sustain getting 17, 20 points a night. Like that's hard to sustain, man. I think uh, the, the, the other thing that I thought I felt like Butler is a little underrated. I still feel like that, even though they landed at six. I just think they're 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 really experienced. And last year they beat both Villanova and Creighton, and they were hurt a lot. They had guys out with COVID. They had guys out with injuries. Yeah, they never really could get into that. Like if anybody got hit really hard by like just the inconsistencies of the COVID year, on top of the fact that they were um, they had injuries to their key pieces, I felt like Butler is the main team that fits that narrative in terms of just not being able to get just ever find your feet. You know, there was never a rhythm with them. They were always, they always had a pause or they had a major injury or two. And I see the fact that they were able to knock off, you know, they beat Creighton without Marcus Zagorowski. So there's a little bit of like, all right, that wasn't Creighton's a game that day. Um, And it went to overtime. 
and Villanova shot horrifically. So, you know, you can kind of like excuse away those two wins, but they still beat the two baddest teams in the league, in my opinion, um, with all the adversity they had to overcome. I like, and they bring a lot, they bring back most of those players, like the whole roster practically. So I like Butler because of how experienced they are. I think Aaron Thompson's, you know, one of the best floor generals in this conference. And, uh, you know, they have really interesting talent and experience around him. Um, so I, I, I would be surprised if they're not a top four team. I just, I like them. I like the way they're built. Um, so I'm surprised they're sixth. That's the one thing. I agree. That's the one I'm glad you brought that up too. Cause I was going to say, even with everything they had going on last year to be able to pull off those big wins, like they had, like mm-hmm. with all that, just inconsistencies throughout their lineup, even they, they still pulled off wins. So yeah, I do think they will be better than projected. I mean, that's what I just think that whole middle of the pack and even you, cause I'm not convinced. I think that's the thing. I'm not convinced UConn is like this, the team of the, in the conference, that's going to, rival nova to win it like i'm like i'm not convinced i'm not even i don't even know if i'm that convinced that nova's that far ahead yet we'll see how things that's, plan out yeah that's the other thing too so is, yeah we'll see the middle of the pack though between just um like st john's butler uh creighton all there in the middle of the pack that's all gonna be a toss-up when it's when it gets to the when it gets to the start of the big east season we'll see who's we'll see how, how teams manage through their non-conference schedule and then so, i'll have a i'll have a better better yeah, understanding yeah, yeah. of what to tell you then no honestly that's true too because as much as we like try to honestly we're just throwing hot takes at the wall right now mm-hmm. the real stuff we, until you get to analyze what they actually look like on film it's hard to know who's good at what and who's, yeah. who's who, where your weaknesses are the thing that i can go on like kind of a homerific rant right now about creighton is picking them eighth is it's in my opinion it's like a, we don't trust Greg McDermott that much like because or he doesn't have like that kind of like status among his peers yet because i don't know here's here's just my scenario okay and i'm not totally saying Creighton and Villanova are one and one or one to one right it's not apples to apples cuz Villanova has won multiple national championships under Jay Wright. So there's a different level there that Creighton hasn't yet achieved. Um, with that said, Creighton brought in a top five recruiting class, fully loaded recruiting class of these highly touted guys, right? And then they bring in, you know, a couple, or like a quality transfer in Ryan Hawkins, who, you know, won national championships, three of them, I believe, at the D2 level. Uh, And then you mix in the experienced guys. Alex O'Connell has played in big games at Duke. Uh, Sharif Mitchell's played in big games, uh, both alongside and backing up Marcus Zagorowski, um, including the Big East title uh, run in 2019-20. And then Ryan Kaufbender got a lot of valuable repetitions, both, you know, behind Christian Bishop, um, during the season and in the NCAA tournament when they went to the Sweet 16. I don't think Villanova is anywhere close to preseason number eight in the Big East if they have a top five recruiting class replacing their starting lineup. I just don't where like I just don't think that ever would happen. They will never be picked lower than like three in any scenario that you give them. So why if Creighton who was consensus one, two, you know, they were, first of all, they were the best team in the league two years ago. Last year, they were the second best team in the league and they proved it without a doubt, right? They beat UConn all three times. There was no drama there. It was Villanova, Creighton, UConn. Why is Creighton eight? Like that just to me is like, you're not, you're not giving Greg McDermott's program enough love there. Cause I don't think that's true. Villanova wouldn't recruit like that to replace their starting five and be eighth. They'd be like three or something at worst, in my opinion. That's so that's where it's, I'm glad you brought that up too, because that me, and it's the point you said it's that they don't trust Mac because it's, Oh, you have this recruiting class, but we don't trust that you'll be immediately good with it. Right. They fit like it'll take a couple of years. Yeah. But we would trust, they would trust it. Even even though it's a top five Villanova would be trusted. 
Yes. Villanova because of the national championships. Mm-hmm. And that's why I'm like, I'm not trying to say there's any excuse. Like it's because of the national championships. Right. They will always be given the benefit of the doubt there. Yeah. To make sure they're in the top three of where regardless of their recruiting class, but I guess for crazy. They'll get they'll get that Nova respect. That yeah. J right. Yeah. Yeah. So the, th- so the thing is, I'm not even mad about Creighton being eighth. I'm I think it's like more of like they're a distant eighth. Yeah, I'm used to it. Weren't we? Right? A, we were pick, we were always picked like eighth or ninth. That's what I'm seven. saying. That's what I'm we're always seven, we're used eighth, to it. We, ninth, we they expect were they were I always pissing how, you guys off. Oh how Nova expects to be first every year. I think I just expect I'm like I, know, I expect them to be like eighth, seventh. Yeah, even I don't care. I'm like, yeah, we'll see. Roll the ball out. Like, <laughs> does it yeah does that does that how often do you guys talk about that when because you've had a couple of those teams that were that were picked eighth and ninth i think two of your teams were were not exp- we're like we don't think much of this group like how much do you talk about that in moments where you're just like it doesn't feel like a day where we can put our best foot forward how much do you use that as motivation does it ever creep i don't up? think Sometimes it was used like explicitly. I think there would be sometimes games where if we came out slow or we're down at halftime, slow start something, we would just be like, come on, man. Like they really, this team better than us. They really, this team was supposed to be fourth. This team was supposed to be whatever they were. Mm. It'll sometimes come out in those moments. Like really, so in, in the, season you would use it then sometimes. Yeah. I'm saying like in the, like halftime of a game, like I'm just trying to think of a specific time, mm. um, that that's one, but I don't think before the season. I think it's you're like you, you expect it. You're like, why would they? We'll show them. Like mm-hmm. we'll show them. They don't. They don't know. Like because when you're in it, like when especially being a part of with Creighton, when you're in it, like you put and you're putting everything into it. Like I did and all that. Like you don't even really think about like because you like we have such good shit going on in this locker room that it's like I don't even care about what anybody else is saying outside because once we go out there, everyone's gonna see. Like, cause we know we've been put into work, so we're going to see, mm. but it's never like a man, they did this. Like we're going to practice extra hard today because they said this about us. They said, we're going to be, no, 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 Roll the ball out. We know what we've been working on. We know what we've been <laughs> doing behind the scenes. So when it's all said and done, what's up? <laughs> like, <laughs> I like that. I, well, I just, I like the edge that it, it's going to give this group of guys. Cause you, it's, I, I think you find out, like just you want to know I like it I like it because they're young they need to be somebody needs to tell them like okay. no you yeah. not humble you're them not like that yet yeah. You, yeah okay somebody I, I'm glad I needed somebody I needed mm-hmm. the Big East to tell them you ain't done shit you what you guys look good on paper you guys got some talent like this is a good team mm-hmm. show me because okay. if it, We'll pick you eight. Show like now it's just in their heads. It, it's got to be a, oh no, real. That's what they think. All right, watch this. That's that's what yeah, the mentality's that's got to be. That's what I mean. Like picking Creighton eighth, they've only finished there one time in this whole run. Like 13, so, that's my thing. So you like, like there's if, they don't belong in that spot ever because they don't. They're never a play in team. They are not. That's not what they. They've only only one time have they been in the play in game in the Big East tournament, meaning they finished seven or lower, right? So it's not like – or uh, eight or lower. So it's not one of those things, like, where it should be in – like, Creighton's done enough to prove to you that they're not ever the eighth worst team in the league. So that's why I'm like, man, even after, like, winning the Big East title, being the one seed at MSG, going to a Sweet 16, yes, they replaced the whole lineup, I got it, but – even after all that, you still don't give – because what's the worst Xavier's ever been picked before either? Like, you know For what I mean? real. Chris so Max replaced yeah. dudes before. Yeah. They never they never dropped to eight. Like, you know what I mean? So, that's what I'm like. I just – I wonder if – I hope, yeah, they, I hope they, they feel disrespected. I hope they do. That's what I, I mean. I like, think, yeah. I hope they're like I – mean. yeah. I hope they're like, really? We did, like, sweet they – everything Crane accomplished last year and even just with recency bias, like, everything that – that they accomplished last year, just even as like a coaching staff or whatever. Yeah. Now we're like, oh no, it's not. We don't trust them to do that. Again. Right. Because okay. I remember, I remember. Last I hope year. they feel disrespected. I hope they're fired <laughs> up. Like that eighth. Okay. 
Don't okay. you remember how UConn felt disrespected last year in, in their first year back? And they were picked fourth. Like, yeah, you know what I mean? They were they were doing a whole bunch of talking. Like, how dare yeah. you pick us? How dare you pick Creighton ahead of us? Like, well, who's Creighton? Like, that's why I'm like, I would have picked UConn last and been like, show me. <laughs> <laughs> you just wanna, you just I'm, jo- I'm joking. I'm joking, but you get what I mean with these preseason being motivational. Tactics. Yeah. Well, all I'm saying yeah. is if so, what what is there? There's 47 points in this poll between Creighton and UConn, and UConn lost their top dog too, just like Creighton lost all theirs. So, like, what you're really telling me is that what you're really telling me is. You think highly, more highly of Dan Hurley than you Greg, do Greg McDermott, and I'm like, I don't know if I would back that. Like, if you told me just knowing what I know, put money on, like, back one of these dudes with your, put your money where your mouth is. I don't know if I would feel like Hurley's got that big of a gap on Hurley's. I think Hurley's just got the, bu- but they that, just, right? but I think they just got the buzz around it. That's what they it do. Is. Like That's Hurley's, saying. Hurley's yeah. got buzz around him in a way that Mac never has you know mm-hmm. and it's just like that's why for people like us who really know the program that Creighton is and like the level at which it should be regarded I just don't think a lot of people know that secret I think yeah. it's like best kept secret one of the best kept secrets in college basketball but I think that's what leads to a lot of it being like the UConn is, is it just the year that UConn establishes himself back in the big east like that's not a it's a sexy story. Creighton doesn't have that, but right, they will yeah. consistent. When UConn will like wins, yeah. When UConn comes back, when they win their first Big East title back in the league, there's yeah. gonna be it's gonna be sickening. Like, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a great story. Yeah, because everybody's that's why football. people are pushing it. Yeah, it's like what does a Creighton another Big East title do? Like, is it the most intriguing storyline? No, but it can happen, and they don't want it to happen. Exactly. So it's gonna put you back down. Maybe kill your confidence a little. Maybe make you. Maybe we can make you believe you're eighth if we tell you you're eighth. So mm, they're like, yeah, no. I feel like it's gonna work in reverse, but that's just what Creighton does. They they kind of always outplay their expectations. Um, mm-hmm. So we'll see if they can do it again. The they will. The one thing where I eighth uh, eighth yeah. come on I know come on eighth Di- a distant eighth. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's not a <laughs> that's close, what I'm like. It's come not on. a close eighth. It's a distant eighth. It's like they're they're closer to. Let me see. Let me I'm like, just... do the do people not realize like there's about to be eighteen thousand in there again? Like, I don't. <laughs> yeah. So here's like here's the thing that's annoying. So they're like, are we acting to... like it's going to be empty? I'm so Xavier's confused. Xavier's third, right? At, they have set. They got seventy six points out of this poll. Um. So Creighton's closer to DePaul than they are to Xavier. That's what. That's what. They're thirty nine points away from. Xavier and 27 ahead of DePaul. So that's what I'm like. It's not a it's not eighth. It's a distant eighth. Like they think they're they think they're like a closer, more of a bottom team than a top team. And who I'm gets like, votes in this? Who who's on this? It's committee? just the coaches. It's just the it's just the it's just the 11 coaches. Glad we, I'm glad we established that. <laughs> glad we established that on that's what I'm saying. It's like that there's he's still that's what Mac doesn't still he doesn't have the respect among his peers. Oh even wait. though Otto so this has got a this has definitely got to fire these coaches up. I didn't know it was just a peer review we're doing. Yes, I didn't know so that that's, that's all this, that's all it is. Oh yeah. these coach, oh yeah. these coaches definitely get fired so up. So it not this. only not only is it a peer because this is just how this, you're though. oh it's it's, yeah. it's it's the coaches in the league think Creighton's a distant eighth, right? They also didn't vote any Jays on all conference teams. I saw that too. I thought I so was it's just like, thinking I was I was waiting to get there. So they don't even so not only do they not think that that this like this current team can do anything, but they don't think there's any like individual player that might pop. I think that'll make it more. I saw that and I was like, what the hell at first? But now I think I'm at the point where I'm like well, this is going to make the story even better because mm-hmm. when whoever does in every year, there is someone. So like even in down years, can't tell me there's not going to be a buck getter, not yeah. going to be someone on this team who's killing dude. Like, so it's going to make it even better when this player from Creighton emerges. <laughs> yeah. Who's exactly. your, who's your, who, who, who's you my pick to go there? Pick to click. Are you, is that, 
We're gonna, I think we should. We're going to do our starting lineup predictions. In a, yeah, yeah, we'll get there. So, but, oh, teaser, so, yeah, teaser. Maybe teaser. that'll. Maybe we'll do our picks to click. Sorry, I couldn't help myself there. Yeah, let's talk about the women's side of it real quick because I think that one's not as surprising to me. I feel like that one was justifiable. Like, so obviously, um, UConn brought in a ridiculous recruiting class. Uh, they had struggled to recruit in the AAC too, so like their recruiting was like falling off a little bit. They come back in the Big East. All of a sudden, Paige Becker shows up. AZ Fudd shows up. Like they're back to being UConn again, so yeah, they're comfortable. They 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 are unanimous number one. The only coach that didn't vote for him was Gino because he can't. Uh, DePaul is two. That's a little surprising to me because everyone kind of took turns beating DePaul's ass last year at the end of the year, and they still don't have a point guard yet. So and that kind of makes if you watch Doug Bruno's teams, the up tempo stuff, the fast break offense, they're not good at that stuff without a point guard. So. I have a question about that, um, but they're second. Uh, Seton Hall is third. Eh. Marquette's fourth. They lost Selena a lot, so that's big. Um, Villanova's fifth. They still have Maddie Segrist. That makes sense. Creighton is sixth. I think that's kind of justifiable because they lost um, Temi Sarda, who was their best player, and brought everyone else back. So I think six is a good spot because that's kind of right around where they ended up last year. So it's a little bit of a tread, uh, treading water thing. You think you'll – He'll supplement Temi's production with some newcomer um, or some young player like Emma Ronsick and Morgan Malley just getting better, right, from freshman to sophomore year. You know how that goes. Uh, mm-hmm. St. John's 7, Providence 8, Georgetown 9, Xavier 10, Butler 11. So, yeah, the women's poll is like there's – the questions are more at the top for me than they are um, am I seeing a team that is kind of getting snubbed. You know what I mean? So – I know, like, we don't have a great grasp on that because they hide them behind the flow sports wall, but is there anything out of that list that you're like, I feel like this team might be on the come up and they're not getting the love yet? I didn't have any. I I, I wasn't too – I didn't have too many complaints about that one just because yeah, I thought it, it if, like they if got anywhere they could have been fifth, I think, I mean, you put mm-hmm. a little bit more respect on their name, throw them at five just because maybe – I mean, in my experience, just – with watching them last year, I thought maybe better than a Nova thought there mm-hmm. might've been a better team just overall, but I don't know. Not too many complaints with it. Thought it was all justifiable. Yeah. I'm with you on possibly better than a Nova. Like, because I mean, Nova's got like the best player of the two teams, mm-hmm. but that was, I think that game was down to the wire and it came down to like, you know, an offensive board here or there. But um, the thing that was weird about the COVID year which is why I'm not sure. Obviously, losing Temi Sarda is huge. Like, she was a – not only was she a bucket, but she was, like, an elite perim- perimeter defender. So, you're losing yeah, a little bit. Her production anyway. last year was – she she turned it up a notch. Yeah. I remember that, that tournament run yeah. she had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Down the stretch for sure. So, you do have to account for replacing that. You know I mean? You can't just say, we're going to give Creighton all this love, even though they lost their best player. Like, you have to earn that a little bit. The thing that – for me that's tough with that I think Creighton has an opportunity to outplay that six spot is they played everything was unbalanced last year right like no one played uh, a balanced schedule because all the pauses and everything like that you know Creighton's schedule was the toughest in the league they got they played UConn twice they played DePaul twice they played Seton Hall um, or they played Marquette twice And then they had all their easy road, easy or easy bottom of the league teams. They had all those games on the road. Um, And, and then the rest of their hard games were also like also on the road. So they didn't get any of their easies at home other than Providence. So that was like, you know, I know they were under 500, but I've, I've argued that had they just flipped a couple of their non-con results, some of their close losses to, you know, you and I or South Dakota State, which was down to the wire a little bit until late fourth quarter. Like, I could have seen them being a bubble team based on just the difficulty of their schedule. I think a 500 record in a in a year like that where you're not playing a full slate and your strength of schedule is absurd and you're going through all these pauses and injuries, like they would have been in consideration. So – when I look at this current team, they bring back a lot of everybody. Like I said, the Temi loss is big, but they also have, you know, Emma Ronsek, Morgan Molly, who are, who came on as freshmen 
Bucket that, getters. Yeah, like bucket getters, right? So <laughs> they, you think they'll elevate, you know what I mean? So they'll make up for some of it. If Tatum Rembaugh's healthy, if Rachel Saunders is healthy, that helps you too because that's experience in the backcourt. Carly Bachelor being healthy, that's more Yeah, do you know what is, what is the status on them? Do you know? Yeah, Tatum hasn't missed any practices yet, so she's been – rocking the whole way at the one um rachel saunders hasn't practiced much yet so that knee is still a, a question mark um, is there a timetable on for her it keeps kind of getting moved around because you know there's just there's just little things here and there that hold it back a little bit so i think the hope is that um she can start practicing after they play iowa in their close scrimmage on saturday so i think the hope is that she can kind of get back into a regular routine after that and then maybe get some um get some run in the exhibition and be ready for you know those early season non-con games um so right but right now it's a question so i understand that then but you add lauren jensen a senior or not a senior but um a sophomore transfer from iowa uh who's just like knockdown shooter i mean this kid's got a trigger like it's a smooth game too she handles it really good I uh, can finish with the right or left hand at the rim. Um, so she'll be able to like facilitate or supplement some of Temmie's perimeter scoring because she's really talented on that end of the floor. The, the, the question will be, you know, how can, how well does Creighton defend on the perimeter without a Temmie Sarda? And a lot of that's probably going to fall on Rachel Saunders shoulders. So getting her healthy is kind of the answer to that. So from that perspective, six makes sense, but I also can see them out playing that at the same time because they do have a lot of they do have a they have a, they have that good mix, Jordan, of like young talent that's still kind of like developing with a lot of experience that's won some big games. That's a good recipe, though. You know what I mean? So when that meshes, yeah. I feel like you can go on some runs yeah. that you know where you'll like win like six games in a row in the middle of the season and feel good about yourself and put together a pretty good resume maybe knock off a team that you no one thought you were going to beat. You yep. know what I mean? So yep. I could get see yourself that. feeling good, getting a rhythm. Yeah. I see that type of year maybe taking place if they get some good injury luck for once. So um, yeah, other than that, I wasn't really sad. I, I think every, the coaches had a pretty good grasp of where everybody should fit on the women's side. We should, can we knock on wood for that right now and pray that this is just a finally healthy, an injury happy injury. Yeah. season? Mm-hmm. Let's do that. Get that one out of the way earlier. Yeah. And then I think, so I think, I think, yeah, Paige Beckers was the preseason player of the year. And then AZ Fudd, who was like being hailed as the Steph Curry of female basketball, women's basketball, was a freshman of the year. So UConn's going to be fun to like watch UConn because they're going to be fun to watch. Like Paige is the ultimate facilitator. And if AZ's got like the trigger that everybody thinks she does, uh, that's going to be a fun team to watch for sure. So I'm disappointed they didn't play Iowa in the non con though. So I wanted that oh, Caitlin so Clark, go, yeah, the Caitlin Clark Page Becker's matchup every year. Start a rivalry, yeah. I know. Why didn't they do that? It was so cool Dude. watching them play in the tournament last year. Thought it was going to be a thing, but let's uh, should we dive into the schedule a little bit? See what we got. Well, yeah, let's circle some dates. Let's yeah, let's circle, circle. So Jordan's got every date circled after the eighth pick. He's like, all right. Oh, I'm hype. I'm counting I'm people. Hyped. Yeah, so up, upper I, the upper Iowa exhibition is uh, this Saturday for the men. So we'll so you get we'll, we'll finally get to see them. Um, there'll be something to evaluate there, right? Yeah, um, we'll have a sample size. Yeah. So what's uh like what what do you what do you think are some of the keys for the Jays in this exhibition game? Like what are they trying? Because obviously they had a really young team, so it feels like the top thing will be rotations, right? Who can play with who? what lineups can be effective at a scoring B getting stops B C getting rebounds. Like, is that kind of the stuff that you're going to be looking for to see if it, how well it gets ironed out in this upper Iowa exhibition on Saturday night? I think, you know, and you know this well enough too. It's just offensively. I'm not too focused on like they need to obviously find some identity, but offensively you can, you can afford to take time to figure out your identity offensively. Mm. They need to defensively show me why need why I should be believing in them <laughs> defensively. Like they need to establish that they're going to be one of the good defensive teams. And that 
Because, like, that's why I think there's a lot of questions with how this team, young team, how they're going to defend. Yeah. Guy, like, <clears throat> who is their elite defender, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think it's going to be a lot of trying to show that, like, they are defensively more imposing even than offensively, and they can be. Because I so, think that that's what's made the teams that I was on successful. Oh, that sure. was like no, yeah, there's de- no, the defensively, yeah. like, the with Kyrie Thomas and all that. Like, when you have that, you can figure things out on any given night back offensively. But really? Okay. Yeah. No, so I, then, I, I'm, so then I'm the question I have then is like the, from a from Creighton's, Creighton's perspective of figuring out defense, that like they're a really scout heavy team. I mean, you know how well the scout team prepares to give the uh, main rotation the best simulation they can during the week. So d- are they going to scout Upper Iowa and then look to see who can execute the scouting report as well as possible? Or how are they going to go into the exhibition in terms of what they're going to evaluate defensively? Yeah, see, that's what I was even going to ask you because I'm interested to know who their primary, like, on, like who's going to be defending the guy for the other yeah. teams, right? So I'll be interested to see that, who they decide is, like, their defensive stopper who's going to take that assignment of trying to shut down the other team's best player every night. Um, and then just even kind of from there, who else, like, I don't know if they're going to do it by platoon. Like how, I, I'm, I'm, I don't really know. So I think I'm interested to get answers to all those lineup questions really. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it feels like going in that perimeter defense defense with like Ryan Nemhart. Oh, by the way. So Ryan Nemhart's nickname on this team is you're going to love it, but it's not, it's not what you think, but it is, it is what we're going to use it for. It's R2 because his name is Ryan and his Jersey number is two. Also, he's the second Ryan, depending on how you shake it out. Um, there's three on this team now. Um, so he's R2. He says it's not because of star Wars, but he also told me he doesn't care if we make it about star Wars. So, Oh, can we make it about Star Wars? We I I, I, I would like. Now, what to. are we? I'm I'm can curious. Just, he's a, he's a point guard, so he's got some like, you know, utility belt features to him as a point guard. So it's all about how we just connect it to our team. It'd be it'd be terrific if we had like, <laughs> I don't know if there was who's who wears number two even on like the women's team. Is there a, is there a two Tatum. on the women's team? Yeah, Tatum. Yeah. R two T two. Can we can we get a podcast episode where we do oh, that? Oh, what did you just say? I got to make sure she still wears two and not fifteen. Hold on. Yeah, she still wears two because she's two T two. Can we R two T two? Damn, Jordan. Can we oh get my. a podcast episode? Can we get it going? <laughs> Let's go. Oh, that just made my day. I can't believe I didn't think of that. Oh my god, that's genius. Yeah, the, so so Ryan Nemhart starting point guard wears number two for the men. Tatum, Rimmel, we got to get the graphics on that. We got to get R2, great graphics. T2. Holy, you got to get the graphics department on that now, dude. I'm so glad like, we're recording. We do right, like Creighton has to know about this. Yep, they got to like market them. You could, they could market the hell. Like, oh my god, dude! That think about that. Crazy. Crazy. There's got to be some like comic book store that's ready to nil the shit out of this when they hear about it, right? Like, oh something. yeah. R2-T2. Holy crap, dude. That's good. I'm excited now. We should just stop the podcast and get this rolling. Um, do it. All right, hold up. We got, we hold, on, hold on. Okay, so wait. So perimeter defense. Is that right, right? God, R2-T2. What a, what a, see, this is why we need to talk. This, this is why, why we have a podcast. This is why we have a podcast, not- people. This, these kind of ideas started like when Jordan was like first. When he got to campus, it was like this in the gym. This is how it happened. This is how it happened. These moments. Um. Oh yeah. So perimeter defense for Creighton. Uh, Nemhard obviously, uh, and Sharif are just like dog dogs. Like they they are really competitive. Um, Sick hard of, nose in your face type of defenders, right? And then it feels yep. like Trey Alexander is kind of like. Um, Ooh, see, there's some stuff to, to like about his his makeup on that end of the floor because he's long and quick for a guard slash wing. Um, So he looks like he might be able to, you know, develop into that Tyshawn Kyrie role where he's got the top assignment from a, you know, a wing standpoint, maybe, you know, because Ryan and Reef are, they can, they can guard multiple positions, but there is a size component to that. They're not the biggest dudes in the world. So, you know, if there's like a, a, a 
physically imposing three that if Trey, Trey Alexander turns into that type of guy, that's more of his assignment than it would be the point guard. So those three seem like the top three options to me for um, creating that identity defensively on the perimeter. Like, I just don't know who else would fit that. Well, that would make sense too. And when you think of especially the preseason player of the year and Colin Gillespie, yeah, who is going to guard him for Creighton? For it to be the Sharif and Nemhard, that's good to hear, you know, because yeah. it's like you want your with the well, because the like best, the, the best, you mean the best players in this league are basically the point guards, like Thompson, yes. Aaron Thompson, yeah, Butler, exactly, SB, Villanova, RJ Cole, you so defensively, those yeah. one two spots got to be strong for sure. Yeah. But that's why, yeah, see, I'm glad you gave that nugget of information because I was like, I didn't know who it would be for the wing, like, because yeah. we that's what I'm, I think that's what I was getting at earlier. I don't know who that, like, leading wing defender is going it's to tough be. too it's tough too because we haven't seen them practice a whole lot i've only seen them practice mm-hmm. they're still the practices are still closed for the most part so i've only seen them like three and a half times technically so i mean there there were three and a half practices where you scored 50 so like <laughs> that's what i'm saying my sample yeah. size is small i could come out of it thinking that something is the case when it couldn't be so um we'll just have to see like it's going to be We'll have to process it the same way everybody else does to some extent. Um, yeah, so that's so basically this first exhibition is what you're saying. You're looking more on the defensive side of the floor to see how this – what lineups work best for, for stringing stops together because the way they play stylistically, the offense kind of comes as it comes. Yeah. I just think knowing in years past the offense, like even last year where I was like, more worried about the offense just um, at the beginning of the year than I was like defense, just because with the guys returning last year, you know, defensively, like everybody was in tune on the same page. You had experience going for you there. So now with it being new guys, I think it's easier to get on the same page um, offensively with new guys than it is defensively. So I know they've put in a lot of time in that in the off season, especially just learning the Creighton concepts defensively. I'm interested to just see if it all, how, how quickly it can all come together defensively. Yeah. I'd be, I'd be much, I feel much more confident about this team if they get the defense going faster than they get the offense going. Like I'm not worried about the offense for them. So, I'm not, so if the defense is ahead of ahead of the offense, you're going to feel fine. Yep. Dude, I'm kind of with you on that too. Cause I felt like, um, what year was it? I even got criticized for saying it too. It was funny. Oh, I think it was last year. Yeah, last year I felt like when they when the when they first played when they first played their first handful of games, I felt like last year the defense was ahead of the offense to start the season. Yes, and yes. I thought that was a really good sign. Great indicator, uh, I think. And we got proven I mean, we, in, a, in to some extent we got proven right because they made the three sixteen and they were competing with Nova all the way to the end, right? And they made the Big East title game by beating UConn in the semifinals. So, yeah, if 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 you trust the stis, the system to produce the offense at some point down the road, that it'll click. Uh, you want to see. You're right. You want to see how far along the defense defense is early in the season, right? Yeah, I agree. The you. two, the two. Just, just, I don't mean to change gears. The two, but I have to ask you about these. We're two. all about, we're all about changing gears on screen. Yeah. Grab, so, so the two I didn't know much about, so I wanted to know if you knew about. Um, well, the one is the incoming freshman, uh, Muhammad at Georgetown. Oh yeah, okay. If you know, because he was like picked he's all, the, all he's these the coaches, freshman of the year preseason freshman of the year pick. Yeah. I looked up some stuff on him. Looked all right. Don't know where that's all coming from. I don't know. I don't know if I, I also didn't look up many other freshmen, so I don't even know, I know. Uh, what I'm going into there besides just the Creighton freshman. Uh, but that was one. And then the other one um, was what the, the player of the year hype. I know he didn't get it, but Julian Champagny, he is, he's got like some real people really are high on him now. Huh? Well, see, honestly, I think the Big East kind of screwed itself in this player of the year thing. Not only – I mean, starting last the end of last year, 
Because they had the three-way tie, and Marcus Zagorowski wasn't one of the dudes. So it's like, so basically, what they what what the coaches told everybody was, uh, here are our top three, like, 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 like you really you really don't like think of Marcus like that in your scout in your scouts and in your like shut the fuck up. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, I just don't believe that. Like yeah. the way the way the way teams had defended him all year. I'm I'm like I'm calling cap on that because like you you defended him like he's the best dude like the best. There was no way that the conversation in the locker rooms when the coaches were going out before they weren't like listen this is play of the year type of potential here like yeah, we got to lock yeah, him down like yeah they were that was that was what was being uttered in those locker yeah. rooms they were like hey and, and, and we don't shut was- this kid down. We can't win. <laughs> right. We gotta we gotta contain him. Or right. We have no chance. We have to get like, him that in was, ass. We have to make him yeah. uncomfortable. And if he goes off, we are screwed. Like we're not winning if he goes off, right? Yeah. But that's all. Like that who happened. the yeah. the person that was guarding him before that game knew to get to bed on time before that game happened. Like yeah. he knew to drink his water and all that before. He, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, they, we, he was. <laughs> it was a there was a game plan for Marcus for sure. Yeah. The that was not. Yeah. Yeah. That was not. I guess talk about in the media and with these polls so that's, and all that. That that's, 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 it, it didn't so they, reflect so they, it. So they screwed themselves in that regard, and then they turned around and like so. Colin Gillespie essentially is the preseason player of the year for the second year in a row, but he didn't win the player of the year last year. So I'm or like you know it's, it's just weird. Like yeah. I mean, I guess he did win. He was one of the co's, right? Wasn't is this him? his six? Is this his sixth year? God, it wouldn't surprise me. What is it? Is is it your number six for him? I don't think it is. I think it's. I think it's like. I think it's just his fourth. Do we know that? But I. I don't think he. I, actually, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe because. Well, no, you because you get the extra year because the COVID year, right? Yeah, but I don't think. That's not this. That's not a, this situation. Or I don't know. Maybe his injury is what's messing me up. Maybe because of his yeah, injury, I thought I, 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 that could he be got that. like another year. But it he's, wouldn't surprise me. I feel like Nova 20, point guards twenty two. So Nova point guards stay there forever, man. Scotty Reynolds was there for like mm-hmm. six years. You remember that? I was mm-hmm. like, wow. Scotty Reynolds is one of those guys that you were really like, wow. You have, and maybe it was because that was like a the transition between middle school and like high school that I was just like, wow, Scotty Reynolds has been at this school for like so long <laughs> since, I was, is, since I was a is, boy. This is Colin's fifth year. So he is coming back with the extra. So no, yeah, you're see. right. He has been around for a minute. But yeah, man, I'm excited to see okay. Kenny J's basketball back in my life. I need that arena full again, back in my life. I need to see it. I don't even remember what I mean, your question was. Did you ask a question about player of the year? How do we talk about that? I oh, no. I just asked if you had known anything about the Muhammad, the freshman at Georgetown. Oh, and then yeah, no. um, Georgetown, didn't even, re- Georgetown didn't even release their roster until like a week ago. So I don't know what the hell is going on. At Georgetown. Yeah. And then I guess we just think Julian Champagne is league bound. But hey, but not what he's not your player of the year. Right. Yeah. I know. Hey, I know. Hey. I mean, he would he would seem like the easy pick for player of the year because he he's like he's the most talented, right? Isn't he the best NBA prospect in this conference right now? Yeah, yeah. No, that's what I'm saying. I think, uh, yeah, probably. Yeah. All right, let's wrap up with our. Should we do our starting lineup predictions for the Jays before we see them? So that way we let's can, do it. So yep. we need to be way wrong or way right. And yep. Yeah. Okay. This is fun. I don't even know what I'm about to come. Should up we go with position here. by position and see what we come yep. up with, or should we do my five year five? Uh, you tell me. I don't care. I'll do either way. Let's go position by position and see what we come. Let's up go. With. Let's Fire! See. Shout let's out to kind of surprises we start out with. Let's uh, let's start one and work our way up. Because I think I'm gonna right. surpri- I, I, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna surprise people at the five. Ooh, um, I like this. Yeah. So, all right. So, who's your who's your replacement for Marcus? Who's starting point guard on day one? And I should give no you some more. information. Sharif Mitchell is not healthy, so factor that. I know. In here. I know. I've talked to him. I've okay. Talked to him. Yeah. <laughs> he's my he's he's my last line of connect. Really. He's, yeah. I, I know. Mean, he's, I, he's your I last know. teammate, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. No, I talked to Sharif. I know AOC a little bit through guys, like through mm. Christian from last year and through Sharif now, but it's really just my con- – my, uh, my correspondent is really just the <laughs> Sharif Mitchell, the okay. one and only Sharif Mitchell. So you so, got Ryan Nemhart as your starting point? I got Ryan because I know Sharif's got ankle stuff and uh, injury yeah. stuff. So, yeah. I think yeah, it's going to be Nemhart. I'm, yeah, I'm with you on that. So we agree there. All right, who's your starting two? Two. Ooh, see, I don't. See, this is where it's going to get like. Pull up a roster page, help yourself in. out. I know. I'm like, I don't. Well, I have it. I just don't know <laughs> just if check I want to. those roster heights real quick and see who qualifies. Go on. We both agree Alex is the starting three, right? Like, that's not a debate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Alex is definitely the starting three. Okay. I don't know too much like well now with the because you said about yeah. trey alexander mm-hmm. i was thinking probably him at the two because that's the if he's going to be that guy uh that's the is tasked with the other team's best player every night that would put him at the two i think because okay. you need need size so here's um, so here so, so here's an interesting question then if if sharif were healthy right now who would start at the two I would put him at the uh, – yeah, I would put them at the two or so, put him at the one and Nemhard at the two so in, some, I, yeah, I'm in, in some capacity, yeah. Okay, so that's like Nemhard, Trey, AOC is our first – our one, two, three. But we both agree that if, if Reef were healthy, he'd be starting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, so who's your starting four? Who's your four man? So this one's a little difficult because I don't yeah. think I've seen enough of – Actually, it's not that tough. I'm gonna just go with Arthur. You're going with Arthur, I, okay? All right. Yeah. So I the 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 question I was gonna ask you to extract it from you is when we talked about um Ryan Hawkins transferring to Creighton and we broke down his like his film, right? We thought mm-hmm. it was there was a lot of like Doug McDermott traits, even though they're not we're not saying he's gonna be you know lead the nation in scoring, but like. There's there's things that he mm-hmm. does fundamentally that remind you of the success Doug had at that at that position at Creighton, right? Mm-hmm. So so my question to you now is that you've chosen since you've chosen Arthur Kaluma, why? Just because I, I mean, I think like you like we, we did. I just think he like he's more of a can work his way into that role kind of guy where I just think now I'm like, Arthur, show me something. Like, I want him to show me why I should have him in the starting lineup, like, okay. instead of someone like John Hood. I think you could integrate more easily into it. I, and I think if, because I'm, again, I, I don't know even to, like, because I think he's earned that too, to be able to start this game. Like, talk about experience. He's one of the guys that's got the most of it. And so, yeah. I think he may even have earned – like, he had, might have earned that starting position, to be completely honest with you. I don't know what that relationship is like. Um, right. I guess within the team or anything like that. Uh, but I just think in terms of the person I want to sh- – like, who has the potential to, I guess, give me the most at that position, I think it is Arthur. I guess that's all I'm basing it on. Yeah, that makes sense. Here's the Here's the – Here's the defense. I, I don't agree with your pick. I have Hawkins there. But here's the reason I can agree with you. I can see Ryan Hawkins accepting a role that on too. the bench that easier too. as a leader more than I can, like, someone like Arthur, who's kind of been the stud everywhere he goes, a top of D recruit. Exactly. You kind of want to, like, get that guy playing time right away to show him that you weren't messing with That around definitely contributes right? it to it. Yes. So, yes. yeah, so – so I yeah I pick I have Ryan Hawkins as my starting four just because of experience like I always lean towards that I think he fits that. I think he fits from a stylistic standpoint he can stretch the floor he can shoot it he can post up he can pass really well he's a good communicator defensively I think he fits the mold of a guy that Mac would trust on both ends of the floor um, but the reason I would I would lend some credence to your pick of Arthur at the starting four is because I can see. Uh, Ryan Hawkins being more accepting of an alter- alternative role if he's not starting and still being a contributor. You know what I mean? 
Absolutely. So, I'm with you. So I, I understand where you're coming from on that one. Okay. So uh, up to this point, that's our first disagreement. We both have the first three are the same. So Hawkins and Kaluma are our, our differences at the four. And I'm pretty sure we're going to disagree at the five. So who do you got the five? Pretty sure we are too, because I'm going to go with Ryan. Okay. So you have Ryan Kalkbrenner, the, yep. third, the third Ryan. So yeah, yep. you have all three Ryans in your starting lineup, yeah? No, Nemhard. Yes. Ryan Nemhard. Oh, you don't have – yeah, you don't have Hawkins. I have Hawkins. No, okay. yeah. So we're yeah. both going to have two Ryans in our starting lineup. Yeah. All right, so you are a big fan of Ryan Kalkbrenner, though. Like, you were really high at him last year. This is true. Is this more just like – is your reasoning right now for starting him just like you expect him to hit the ground running as a sophomore in his second year with – with with uh, the most experience at that position coming back? I, yes, there's all of that. Like, I'm – it's no secret. I've said it on this podcast many times how much of a fan I am of Ryan and his just development at the center position. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think this is also where I look at the lineups with this team. I think there are going to be those games where you want to throw like the lineups of like, you kind of want to go small with this team because it's like Arthur at the five, Ryan Hawkins. Yeah. 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 Okay. There's going to be those times. So I think out the gate though, I'd like to see, like, because win the jump ball. Ryan's not going to lose many jump balls to people. Mm-hmm. And then also just ha- win the establish jump, that. Winning the jump ball is big for you? <laughs> I mean, it's not a big indicator, but I'm just saying. So, just like, to if, paint, if, just if, to if paint a like, picture. A just to paint a picture. If it's a coin toss, you want rock first, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I'm just like, it, it's long, like you have that. But then also, I think it's like I was saying defensively at the beginning of the games to have that rim protector in there. No layups to start the games off. Have him run and get some early dunks. Get it like I think that establishes pace early, even just remembering from teams with like um, I think early, even my freshman year when Zach Hansen was healthy, like when he was able to like run the floor and just establish his presence on that block early in games, get a couple easy buckets like that's the role I think I can see him stepping into more this year. Mm. And so that's why I would go ahead and start my man. Um, yeah. Gotcha. Sound analysis, my, my good man. Sound analysis. Um, right, what you got th- for me? What this you got is kind of, this me? is where I'm probably going to send a shockwave through Blue Jay Nation. Ooh, I like um, it. But I'm not doing it for shock factor. Don't, I'm not a shock shock. Like I'll, I'll, no, I only say, I say what I feel. I say what I mean. So this means this, I mean was calculated. I this was calculated. This was calculated. So I'll it's calculated it to me. Yeah, it so I'm saying what I feel and I'm meaning what I say. I think – and it's based on what I've seen. So, again, remember what I said about the sample sizes. I've only seen this team practice three and a half times technically, and I could have watched Jordan Scurry at any point in his career three times and said that's, like, the best two guard in the Big East. You know what I mean? If he would, if I caught him on the right day, it was Bucket City. He's better so, than Miles Powell. What? Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. He was simulating Miles Powell and Marcus. Yeah, like he was getting shots up. If he if he was knocking them down that day, if he was feeling it, yeah, I would I would have thought he's an All American. So it's all about sample sizes here. However, based on my sample size of what I've observed, I have Keyshawn Fizel as the starting five, the McNeese State transfer. Oh, that's yeah. great news. See, so I wanted to hear. So this. here's the thing I see. And it's not a knock on, and that, I know what people are gonna think. It's probably gonna be like, oh, so Kalkbrenner's struggling or something. I haven't seen that either. I think Kalkbrenner's doing fine, but Keyshawn's uh, obviously he's more mature physically because he's a grown up, right? He's a fifth year, I think. This is his fifth year, um, so he's a senior. He's played in the SEC. He's been the man at McNeese State. Um, the thing that surprises me about his game is he shoots the ball better than I thought he would. Like, I think he's a. Oh, 20... this is like breaking news to me right now. This I think is he, like I think he's I, a twenty. He was one of the ones I did not know enough about, okay. but I thought he could be. He could actually even step into that four role because I was like, oh, he could defend. He could it, like I'm. I'm just hypothetical because I didn't know. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, if he could give like those good minutes as like the big. That changes a lot. Okay. Yeah, I so I'm with you. So, like, yeah, I, I I have him as a starting five for these reasons. He shoots it from the perimeter better than I thought he was going to. That's like, I, I think he's a 20% hear. shooter for his career. He's better than that, I'm telling you. like That's great. The shot, the shot looks good. He repeats his mechanics, and he knocked, he knocked him down at a pretty good clip. I, he's not going to hit two a game, 
But he's a guy that if you leave him open and he's in rhythm, he'll get one. He'll he's gonna make a defense pay for that. Yeah. Um, so I think that's important because it makes it's just the one thing that Creighton hasn't had at that five spot the last couple of years. Christian wasn't a guy who would make a defense pay for backing off on him. Um, also, he's really good. Uh, he, he in in what I've seen, he has really good. He plays off of Ryan Nemhard, Trey Alexander, those. You know, with those little dribble handoff, the hit and chase action that Creighton likes to do, and he's good at finishing those plays at the rim. So yeah, I was going to say he's he experienced, the floor vertically. he's physical, he can stretch the floor, and he plays really well uh, in that two man game, that big little two man game with the DHOs and the ball screens and everything. I've liked what I've seen out of that. I mean, honestly, the media day practice, Jordan, like you would have remember when you and Davion used to talk about when Marcus Foster would punch and. You would just like lose your minds. He yeah. had one dunk. This dude did at the media day practice. I'm serious. Like it had to have registered on the Richter scale because he almost ripped the roof down. Like because the roof, the basket's hanging from the roof, right? He oh, yanked this. Up. He did a number up. He rocked the shit out of this rim. I'm serious. Like oh, let's. I go. looked over at Niatawa and we were both like, because it was yeah. Oh yeah, he maybe he might have to get the start then. If he's stretching the floor, floor vertically like that and running the pick and roll game with Ryan, like that could be some serious. So okay. I'm gonna still stick with my pick. No, it's I good. like your yeah. your pick. Just gave me way more insight and way more reason to be excited. Mm-hmm. So glad to know that sample, information um, now. Asterisk sample sizes, sample sizes, sample sizes. I've only seen sample sizes. Yeah, but I just but I can't. I based on that yeah, that's... I'm based on my observations. That's my five. And I think Jordan, you came up with some pretty good like reasoning for your five as well. So we're so basically we have there's no surprises at one, two, three for either of us, right? Nemhard, uh, Ryan Nemhard, Trey Alexander, Alex O'Connell at the one, two, and three. Where we veer off track is you have Arthur Kaluma and Ryan Kalkburn at the four and five. I have Ryan Hawkins and Keyshawn Fiesel at the four and five. So really, your experience is more at that wing spot with AOC. Mine is more in the in the post, yeah, and in the front court, right? Traditional. Front and court. I think that might actually, yeah, yeah. We'll see. I think that might actually be the. It'll be fun to see. I think tell. I think that might be the tell here, um, especially when we get the real lineup for Mac and everything. It might be the tell yeah. because I think that experience now, that I'm like actually seeing it versus your lineup. Mm-hmm. Is actually a very crucial component, I think, to starting off a season well. That first, um, that first, so or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I would not be mad if we found out tomorrow that was the starting lineup. I would not be upset in any way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, I do. I just think we'll see. We'll see what happens with. And like you said, like the point about John being one of the guys who, or or Ryan being one of the guys who is more willing to. Um, step into that role of yeah, like still being a contributor. Right. Yeah, right, for sure. I'm, I'm going to lean on that one. I'm going to lean on that yeah. one for the reasoning behind it, I think. Yeah, because you understand what that's there, like, yeah. right? All role acceptance is it's everything as valuable for a team as, just, yeah. as almost anything. Like if mm-hmm. you if you can put your ego aside and be like, all right, I don't care if my name is shouted out before tip-off or not, just put me in the role that you think helps us be most successful. If, if you told me – I have to pick the starting lineup based on who those five guys are who don't care about coming off the bench or don't care what their roles are as long as they're contributing. Yeah, I it makes a lot of sense the way you shook out your lineup. I agree. Yeah, for sure. Just keeping it real. <laughs> I think we had a good – if this was season two E1, if this was S2 E1, I think Man, we did a pretty good job. I think this is a pretty I good job. I like this new seat. I, I'm comfortable now. I got this, like, expensive-ass yeah. chair. It's really nice. It's I like – I could – we could we could go for hours. I'm excited for this new season, season I two. I see it off like right. This, we kick it off right. chair I got here, I, like, sink into this. My I built a new desk to, like – I think we both have a good little podcasting vibe going on. I like it. I think, I think, yeah, I think we're getting just like every, anything, man, you know, you get experience. You, we have our sample size was only a year mm-hmm. now. We're, mm-hmm. we're going on the second year here. So we'll see what we cook up with this year. For sure. All right. So we, uh, that's, that's S2 E1 for everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Scurry and the Scrub. I'm Matt. He's Jordan. Uh, yeah. We'll be coming back at you on a more regular basis for sure because there's more stuff for us to dissect and talk about. You know we'll be back. Until then, we appreciate you all tuning in. Um, We'll have this up on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube. You know where to find it, so subscribe. Um, 
and follow along as we take you through this 2021 22 season. Damn, the years Let's are going by, dude. <laughs> I know. Shoes now. Let's go. Whole new decade. Let's go. Whole new decade. Let's do it. Let's go.